When 23-year-old Juri Kibuishi walked into a room, you couldn't help but notice her. Just five foot, three inches tall, beautiful and outgoing, Juri, whose Americanized name was Julie, had a freewheeling personality and instinctive kindness that just drew people to her. From the flowers that she often pinned in her dark hair to her dramatic eyeliner and colorful painted fingernails, Julie looked like what she was, creative and unconventional. Despite their much more proper and low-key appearance, Julie's Japanese-born parents had always encouraged their daughter's artistic pursuits. And when Julie, a lifelong resident of Irvine, California, was high school aged, she was accepted into the prestigious Orange County School for the Arts. This was a highly selective charter school that catered to students who were especially interested in the visual and performing arts. But Julie's parents had also stressed the importance to all four of their children of getting excellent grades. So even as Julie spent five years studying dance and becoming a gifted and passionate performer, she also applied herself with just as much energy to her college preparatory courses. Julie's goal after high school was to dance and to eventually get a degree in fashion design. She found just the program she wanted at Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa, California, one of the top transfer community colleges in the country and just a 30 minute drive from Irvine, California, where Julie lived with her parents. At Orange Coast, Julie could get her associate's degree and start work in fashion right away. And then if she wanted to, she could transfer to a four year college. She would also have time to take dance classes and keep performing. Located 37 miles south of Los Angeles, Costa Mesa is a busy commercial city about a mile from the Pacific coast. Not nearly as expensive as Los Angeles, Costa Mesa was a magnet for aspiring actors and artists and writers who hoped to make their way into some aspect of show business, whether it was movies, the stage, dancing, or script writing. Julie loved the creative energy at Orange Coast, and she also loved all the different types of people who are drawn to a community college, from older students with day jobs to younger students like herself. One of these students was 26-year-old Samuel Herr, an army veteran whose military service included 15 months in a remote and dangerous outpost in Afghanistan. Five foot 10 inches tall and 200 pounds, Sam had movie star good looks and an outgoing personality. An only child of older parents, Sam's father had served in the Marines, and like his father, Sam had also found purpose, meaning, and self-discipline during his time in the military. Sam's fellow soldiers described him as courageous and funny. The women he served with described him as very professional and chivalrous. In 2010, after his army enlistment ended, Sam had also enrolled in Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa. This was the first step in his plan to earn the college degree that he needed in order to re-enter the military as an officer. Although Julie and Sam came from very different backgrounds, as soon as they met each other in an anthropology class, they totally hit it off. Not in a romantic sense, each of them had serious long distance relationships with other people, but as friends. Both of them were very close with their families, they enjoyed socializing, and they both had the same outgoing personalities and the same slightly goofy sense of humor and fun. They also both liked tattoos. Julie had seven of them, and Sam had ink on both arms as well as a huge heart inscribed with mom and dad tattooed on his chest. But on a deeper level, Sam and Julie were also both very serious about getting good grades in college and ultimately achieving their long-term career goals. So as soon as Julie realized that her classmate Sam was struggling in their anthropology class, she offered to help tutor him. One evening, when Sam's parents stopped by their son's apartment and met Julie, who was there helping Sam with his homework, they were both struck by the easy friendship between their son and Julie. And when Julie would go on to describe Sam to her parents, she would say they were just friends. One of the nice things for both of them about being in a strictly platonic relationship was being able to talk to one another about their romantic partners. Julie was in an online relationship with a Marine corporal named Mark, who was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, and Sam was engaged to a German woman named Katerina, whom he had met while he was in the service. Sam also felt comfortable opening up to Julie about his combat experience in Afghanistan and the night terrors that he had brought home with him. 
As their friendship grew, Julie began spending more time with Sam outside of just tutoring. And one thing they both liked to do together was spend time with the group of young people who often gathered in the evenings and on the weekends outside of the large apartment complex where Sam lived. For Sam, the Camden Martinique Apartments, which is where he lived, were the perfect location. It was less than a half mile from Orange Coast College and only a 30 minute drive from where his parents lived in Anaheim Hills. The rent wasn't cheap, but Sam had always been very careful with money and he had saved $62,000 in combat pay that he had earned while he was serving in Afghanistan. Among the big group of young people who hung out together at the apartment's pool and outdoor patios, there was one couple in particular that Julie and Sam got to know pretty well. 26-year-old actor Daniel Wozniak and his fiancée, 23-year-old actress Rachel Buffett. Like a lot of actors, Dan and Rachel struggled to make ends meet even as they dreamed of breaking into the Los Angeles acting scene. Rachel, who was small with delicate features and long blonde hair, still looked the part of the Disney princess she once played at Disneyland when she was a teenager. Dan, who was a big guy, had an easy smile, thick dark hair, good looks, and a booming voice that helped him land lead roles in the community theaters where he and Rachel often starred opposite one another. Usually dressed in khaki shorts or pants and Hawaiian shirts with bright prints, Dan never felt more at home or more genuinely himself than when he was on stage. In the spring of 2010, when Julie and Sam met Dan and Rachel, Rachel was busy planning the couple's wedding. After a two-year-long engagement, the big date was finally just weeks away, May 28th, and afterward, the couple would go to Mexico for their honeymoon. On Friday, May 21st, just a week before Dan and Rachel were going to get married, Julie had a date with her older brother, Taka, at a Thai restaurant in Long Beach to talk about his wedding. Taka also had a surprise for his younger sister, he and his fiancée wanted Julie to be a bridesmaid at their wedding, and that night at dinner, Taka handed Julie the tiara that she would be wearing on Taka's big day. Julie was thrilled, but she was also feeling a little distracted and worried. Throughout that afternoon and evening, Julie had started to receive a series of very strange text messages from her friend Sam. He sounded upset, and he told her he needed to talk to someone. In what she thought must be a bad attempt at humor, he wrote, no sex. Can you come over tonight at around midnight? Just talk, don't tell anyone. Going out for a little now, some bad family stuff. Julie was puzzled. Like her, Sam seemed to get along with his mother and father really well. In fact, she thought he was supposed to be visiting with them in Anaheim that weekend. Julie told her brother about these weird messages she was getting. Taka asked her if this was normal for Sam, and she said no, but Sam had been through a lot. Noticing her brother looking concerned, Julie looked up from her phone and smiled at him and said, don't worry, you'd like Sam. After dinner, Julie said goodbye to her brother and laughing, she put the tiara on just before stepping out into the clear 60 degree evening. She could feel the light breeze from the ocean as she climbed into her car to make the 35 minute drive south from Long Beach to the Camden Martinique apartments where Sam was. The following morning, Julie's mother, June, looked down the bedroom hallway of their house and noticed the door to her daughter's bedroom was open. Peeking inside, she saw Julie was not in there, and she realized in that moment that her daughter had not come home the night before. June immediately called and texted Julie, but received no answer. When she called her son Taka to see if maybe Julie had stayed the night with him and his fiance, June's worry deepened to alarm. Taka said no, Julie was not with them, and he told his mother about the very strange text messages that Julie had received from her friend Sam. Feeling very concerned, Taka and his mother began scrolling through their texts and contacts to see if they could find Sam's number. Meanwhile, about 20 miles away in Anaheim, Sam's parents had also begun worrying about their child. Sam was supposed to visit them that morning, but he hadn't shown up yet. Sam had always been good about letting his parents know if his plans had changed or if he was running late, but by midday, they still had not gotten a call or text from him. By late afternoon, Sam's father, Steve, who was an athletic-looking man with thick white hair who often went to the gym with his son, he hopped into his car and drove up to Costa Mesa to make sure Sam was okay. Once Steve arrived at the Camden Martinique apartments, it was getting dark. He walked up the stairs to apartment D-110 and knocked on the door. 
when he didn't hear an answer, Steve reached into his pocket and pulled out the spare apartment key that Sam had given him. He unlocked the door and he stepped inside. Turning on the light, Steve saw immediately that there was no one in the kitchen or living room and also no sign of any disturbance. As he headed toward the bedroom, he hoped he'd find his son laid up in bed with a bad cold. Instead, as he pushed open the door to the bedroom and flipped on the wall light, it was like he had discovered a chamber of horrors. Kneeling next to the bed with her upper body lying stomach down on top of the mattress was the body of a young woman. Her jeans, which were cut or torn, had been pulled down almost to her knees. On the back of her sweater, scrawled in black magic marker, were the words, All yours, F you. Although one side of the woman's face was visible, she was totally unrecognizable. Her features were covered in blood and gore, and all Steve could really see was just this massive wound above and behind her ear. It looked like the back of her head had been blown off. And just above that crater of bone, blood, and brain tissue, Steve saw a tiara tangled in a mass of blood-soaked hair. Shocked, Steve backed away from the gruesome scene, and after quickly checking the other rooms and finding no one else in the apartment, he pulled out his phone and he dialed 911. Near the doorway to the bedroom, police found a colorful shoulder bag. It contained a cell phone and a wallet with a driver's license. The victim, sprawled on the bed and the floor, was 23-year-old Julie Kibuishi. When they were informed by police that their daughter was dead, Julie's parents were devastated. June Hibuishi kept telling the officers they must have made a mistake. The evening before, she and her daughter had been cooking together in the kitchen. When it had been time for Julie to go see her brother at the restaurant, she had changed her clothes, given her mom a quick hug, said goodbye, and stepped out the door. It was impossible to June and her husband that this daughter, who was so kind and so full of life, could now just be dead. As for the Costa Mesa detectives who arrived on the scene moments after receiving Steve Herr's frantic 911 call, every piece of evidence they discovered inside of that apartment pointed to Steve's son, Sam. Sam knew the victim, and from the words written on the back of Julie's sweater and the position of her body that suggested sexual assault, she may have been caught up in a love triangle gone wrong or been the victim of a domestic dispute with Sam. Most damning of all was the long string of strange text messages that Sam had sent Julie the night before, begging her to come see him immediately. And even though Sam said, quote, no sex in one of his text messages, just the mention of sex seemed to indicate that it was possible that these two were, in fact, romantically involved, despite what they told people. And then there was Sam's military background and his combat experience in Afghanistan, and the possibility that Sam, like many combat veterans, was affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. Maybe Sam had just snapped and killed Julie during an episode of combat-related psychosis. The cause of death appeared to be a single gunshot wound to Julie's head, and as a trained combat soldier, Sam would have known how to use a firearm. 24 hours later, when Sam still had not been located or heard from, the Costa Mesa police had found yet another reason to suspect he was their killer. After digging into Sam's background, detectives were stunned to discover that back in 2002, when Sam was 18 years old, he had been arrested and charged in connection with the murder of another teenager. Although Sam was eventually acquitted and cleared of all charges, he had been a serious suspect, and he had spent the better part of a year behind bars. The police wasted no time. They issued an all-points bulletin with Sam's picture and physical description plastered across the top of it. Meanwhile, however bad things looked for Sam, Steve Herr could not believe that his son killed Julie. Sam had been acquitted of all criminal charges related to that 2002 murder, and even after the trauma and stigma of spending months in jail, Sam had gone on to rebuild his life and reputation. He always had a steady job from that point forward, but it was when he enlisted in the army that he found his true sense of meaning and purpose. So while police launched a massive manhunt for the man they considered armed and dangerous, Sam's father started to do his own digging. If Sam was on the run, he would need money, and Steve shared a bank account with his son. Sure enough, when Steve accessed the shared account, he saw that every day since his disappearance, Sam had used his ATM card to make a series of large cash withdrawals. The trail led south to a bank of ATMs in Long Beach. 
The police had also tracked Sam's ATM card, and unlike Steve, they had access to the video surveillance at the ATMs. Looking at the camera footage, detectives expected to see the face of Sam Her. Instead, the person seen using Sam's card was a teenage boy carrying a skateboard and wearing sunglasses and a hoodie. When the same ATM card was used to place a pizza order at a nearby pizza joint called Echoes, police were able to get the address of the house where the pizza would be delivered. They staked out that address, thinking that maybe Sam was hiding inside of the house. But when police, guns drawn, entered the house right alongside the pizza delivery person, the only people they found inside were the teenager they'd seen on the ATM surveillance tape and his mother. A terrified 16-year-old Wesley Freilich told police that he had been given the ATM card by a man he knew who was working for a bail bonds agent. The man had told Wesley that the card belonged to a client who had posted bond but then disappeared without paying the agent. According to Wesley, this man who had given him the ATM card was someone his mom knew through the community acting that she did. Wesley said he was a good guy and he trusted him when this guy outlined the plan with the ATM card. Wesley would make withdrawals every day of up to $400 and turn the money over to the man who would wait in his parked car some distance from each ATM machine. As payment for doing this, Wesley would be allowed to use this ATM card to order pizza for himself. The name of this mystery man was instantly familiar to police. 26-year-old actor Daniel Wozniak. Daniel and his fiance Rachel, who were both friends with Sam and Julie, had been among the residents of the apartment complex that police had interviewed the day after Julie's body had been discovered. And in the course of that routine interview with them, Dan had told police that he and Rachel had last seen Sam on the afternoon of Friday, May 21st, which was the night Julie had dinner with her brother before going to see Sam. Daniel told police that he, Rachel, and Sam had chatted briefly that night, and then Sam had left the apartment complex with a man in a black hat who Dan did not recognize. After determining that the 16-year-old Wesley had no personal connection to Sam Herr, police decided to turn their attention back to Dan. The bail bondsman story just sounded like a total fabrication. They now suspected that Daniel might be helping Sam get money and that Dan might even be hiding or covering for his friend. But tracking down Dan for a second interview turned out to be much more difficult than the police expected. When they finally reached Dan on his cell phone and asked him to come into the Costa Mesa police station for another interview, Dan was evasive. He wanted to help, but he was busy. It was the final week of the play Nine, in which he and Rachel had starring roles. They were also just days away from getting married, and when they weren't rehearsing or on stage, they were busy with last-minute wedding plans. Frustrated, detectives decided not to wait any longer. On the evening of May 25th, just three days after Julie's murder, detectives crashed Dan's bachelor party. They found Dan, dressed in his trademark khaki pants and Hawaiian shirt, at a suburban Japanese restaurant named Tsunami in Huntington Beach. Guns drawn, police entered through both the front and back doors. That way, no one could get out of the restaurant without being seen. At about 10 p.m., in front of his stunned group of friends, police snapped handcuffs on Dan and charged him with accessory to murder. Dan was completely shocked, and the color in his face just completely drained. But once Dan was inside the police station, his demeanor changed. He suddenly seemed somewhat composed and told police that he wanted to tell them what his real connection to Sam Herr was. Sitting in a plastic chair in the corner of the small interrogation room, Dan took a deep breath and then came clean. He told police that the whole bail bondsman thing that the 16-year-old kid was involved in was indeed a fabrication. It was a cover for a credit card scam that he and Sam were in on together. The way it worked was Wesley, the 16-year-old, would make a series of large cash withdrawals using Sam's bank cards, and then Sam would put in a claim with his bank saying he never authorized the withdrawals. This, of course, allowed Sam and Daniel to keep the cash Wesley had taken out, as well as the reimbursement money they would get from the bank. Wesley did not realize this was going on. He thought this was all legit, and he really was working for Daniel, who was working with a bail bondsman, and Wesley thought he was just getting some free pizza out of it. His mother was also unaware of the scam. 
The police proceeded to ask Daniel the same questions they had asked before when they spoke to him at the apartment, and Daniel gave the same answers. The last time he saw Sam was on that Friday afternoon, shortly before he saw him walk off with some guy in a black hat, and then that night, Daniel and his fiancée Rachel had been at their theater performing in their musical called Nine. But then something odd happened. About 30 minutes into this interrogation, Daniel suddenly completely changed his story. The police were so caught off guard that they really didn't even interrupt. They just let him speak. One minute, Daniel was talking about this credit card fraud scam. And then the next minute, without missing a beat, Dan told detectives that, well, in fact, Friday afternoon had not been the last time he had seen Sam. In his new version of events, Dan told police that in the very early hours of Saturday, May 22nd, Sam had knocked on the door of Dan and Rachel's apartment. When Dan got out of bed and walked through his darkened living room and opened the door, he saw his friend standing in the doorway looking totally frantic and disheveled. Sam immediately told Dan that something horrible had just happened and that the two of them were in trouble and they needed to get the F out of there as soon as possible. Dan, who thought this must have something to do with their credit card scam, immediately stepped back into his apartment and, being careful not to wake up Rachel, put on his clothes. A few minutes later, he and Sam were driving Sam's car south to the Long Beach Town Center Mall where Sam had asked to be dropped off. And it was during that drive that Daniel heard exactly what the horrible thing was that had just happened. And it had nothing to do with a credit card scam. Sam went on to tell Dan that Julie was in his apartment and that he had killed her. Dan told police Sam's exact words. I shot somebody. It was a fit of rage. I was doing some heavy drugs. I'm not happy about it, but she had it coming. The two detectives looked at each other. This was exactly the break in the case that they had been hoping for. Daniel's story had just confirmed their own reconstruction of the crime. Now they hoped that Dan could help them locate their killer, Sam. According to Dan, he had no idea where Sam was or where he was going, and that before they parted ways, before Sam got out at that mall, he had threatened Dan and told him that if he went to police and ratted him out, that Sam would come back and kill him, or he'd come back and he would kill his fiance Rachel. And so when police had questioned Dan and Rachel the day after the murder had been discovered, Dan had panicked and lied to police in order to protect himself and his fiance. He told police there was no man in a black hat, that he had made that up. At this point in the interrogation, Daniel was a wreck, and he just repeatedly apologized to police for misleading them. But despite Dan's sincerity, the police were now concerned that he might be hiding even more information about Sam, and so they decided to apply some pressure. At 11.43 p.m., about one hour into this interrogation, police asked Dan if he would give them permission to take a DNA swab. That way, they could confirm that Dan was never present at the actual crime scene. Right away, Dan agreed. At this point, he was extremely eager to do anything he could to remove himself from the suspect list. As soon as the detective finished taking the swab out of Dan's mouth, the video camera inside of the interrogation room captures Dan's very obvious sense of relief. It was clear as he started to check his pockets and put his cup of coffee down on the floor that Dan thought this whole thing was over. The interview was over, he had done the swab, and now he could leave. But just seconds later, as the detective who had taken the DNA swab peeled off his gloves, the other detective asked Dan where exactly in Sam's apartment were police investigators likely to find Dan's DNA. Since Dan was a regular visitor in Sam's apartment, if they were going to use his DNA to rule him out as a suspect, they needed to know what Dan had already touched. And this question seemed to startle Dan. The camera footage showed him running his hands through his thick black hair, and for the first time, Dan looks kind of nervous, but he does tell police that they are likely to find his DNA in both the bathroom and perhaps out on the patio. Those are the two places he would go inside of Sam's apartment. After Dan says this, one of the detectives asks Dan point blank, did you see Julie's body inside of Sam's apartment? Dan practically shouted that he had not, that all he knew about the murder was what Sam had told him in the car on the way to the mall that night. But the detectives, noticing that Daniel was really starting to fall apart and act nervous, they decided to ramp up the pressure by bluffing. Leaning forward towards Dan, who was now leaning back in his chair, one of the detectives asked Dan, So, 
If you claim you were only in Sam's bathroom and patio, then why did we find your DNA inside of Sam's bedroom near Julie's body? Now, keep in mind, they had no way of knowing if his DNA was inside of that apartment. They wouldn't have known for weeks. But Dan didn't know that. He thinks what they're telling him is factual. And as soon as they said this to him, Daniel changed his story again. Looking totally defeated, Dan slumped down in his chair and he said, okay, okay, I'll tell you. This is what really happened. According to Dan, when Sam arrived at his apartment in the early morning hours of Saturday, May 22nd, and told Dan they needed to get the F out of there, before they got in the car and drove away, Sam had told Daniel what he had done and then took Daniel up to his apartment and actually showed him Julie's body. At this point in the interview, the cameras show Dan back on his feet, pacing across the small windowless room. He's agitated and he's running his fingers through his hair. And for the next three hours, the two detectives pressed for more details about exactly what Dan had seen in Sam's bedroom. By 2 a.m. on Thursday, May 27th, Dan had been talking, yelling, and sometimes whispering to police for four straight hours. He was exhausted, and since he was getting married in now less than 48 hours, he was desperate to just wrap this up so he could go. So at 2.17 a.m., Daniel, who had been caught completely between a rock and a hard place, between trying to protect his friend or telling the cops everything he knew, seemed to crack. Yes, he finally shouted at detectives. Yes, I saw her goddamn body. Is that what you want to hear? I saw two gunshots in her head. Both detectives suddenly went completely still and looked at each other. They also looked up at the camera that was recording the interview and playing it live in an adjoining room where a third detective was watching it. All three detectives were thinking the exact same thing. Dan Wozniak had just given them a critical new piece of information. Based on what would stretch into a 14-hour interrogation of Daniel Wozniak and an investigation into the new evidence police would uncover based on what he told them, this is the reconstruction of what happened to 23-year-old Julie Kibuishi and how police were finally able to locate their prime suspect, Sam Herr. Back on the evening of Friday, May 21st, about half an hour after Julie had left that Thai restaurant in Newport Beach where she was having dinner with her older brother Taka, Julie pulled into the parking lot next to the Camden Martinique Apartments where she had agreed to meet her friend Sam Herr. Although she was still wearing the sparkly tiara that her brother had just given her, Julie's mood had turned serious. Before heading into Sam's apartment, she scrolled one more time through the dozens of text messages he had sent her starting that afternoon. They all seemed so strange and out of character for Sam, but she knew Sam dealt with some very serious night terrors from his time in Afghanistan, and for all she knew, he could be having some sort of breakdown right now that was Afghanistan-related. So, believing Sam really just needed a friend right now, she put her phone away, got out of her car, and made her way over to the stairs that would take her up to his apartment. When she reached the floor his apartment was on, she saw Daniel standing outside of it. It turned out Dan had become worried about Sam too when Sam had not been responding to his knocks on his door. Dan told Julie he did have a spare key and thought, you know, maybe the two of them should just go inside and see what was going on. Grateful for the company, Julie waited a minute after Dan had unlocked the door and walked inside. Then she followed Dan into the apartment. There was no sign of Sam, but a few seconds later, Julie, who was standing in the front area of the apartment, she heard a terrified sounding Dan call out from Sam's bedroom in the back of the apartment. She asked what was going on and Dan just called out, you'd better come in here, there's something in his bed that you need to see. And so Julie began walking towards the bedroom. Several hours earlier, Daniel had called Sam and asked him to go with him to one of the small community theaters where Dan often performed. It was called the Liberty Theater and was located about 30 minutes north of their apartment complex. Daniel needed help moving a heavy piece of set furniture that was wanted by another local community theater. Sam agreed, and the two met outside in the parking lot of their apartment building. Then they hopped into Sam's car and they headed north. Once they arrived, Dan led Sam through the empty theater, and when they were backstage, they climbed a flight of stairs to the second floor, and then once they were up there, Dan pointed out a dusty wooden ladder that led up to the attic. 
So up they went, and as soon as they were up there, Dan quickly walked over to this big piece of furniture and signaled to Sam that that was it. That was the piece they were going to move. Sam nodded and moved past Daniel and took up a spot next to him, kind of crouching down to get a good grip underneath this big piece of furniture. Little did Sam know that his friend, Daniel, who was now standing behind him, could not have cared less about moving furniture. Instead, Dan was quietly pulling out a 38 caliber semi-automatic pistol. And then once it was out, he aimed the pistol carefully at the back of Sam's head, and then he pulled the trigger. For a moment, all Dan could hear was the echo of the shot reverberating around the attic. And then Sam, who was still alive, turned to look up at his friend. Sam whispered, I need help. I need help. Something hit me. I, I think I've been electrocuted. Looking directly into Sam Hur's eyes, Dan raised the pistol and pulled the trigger a second time. Except the weapon didn't fire. It jammed. So while Sam is laying there staring up at Daniel with a look of horror on his face, Daniel calmly pulled the slide back of the pistol. He cleared the jammed round out of the gun. He reloaded the gun and then placed the gun up against Sam's temple and pulled the trigger again. This time, the gun did fire, and this time Sam would die. Then Dan, stepping carefully to avoid the blood that was spreading out across the floor, bent over Sam's body and removed his phone, and rifling through his friend's wallet, Dan pulled out Sam's passport and Sam's ATM and credit cards. Flipping Sam's phone open, Dan began to send what would be a long string of text messages to Julie. Each one was carefully scripted to draw her to Sam's apartment later that night and to look to an outsider as though Sam was in the midst of a personal crisis and that he and Julie were somehow romantically involved. Leaving Sam's body where it had fallen, Dan climbed back down the wooden ladder, down the flight of stairs to the ground level, left the empty theater, and got into Sam's car. But before going back to his apartment, Dan picked up the 16-year-old Wesley Freilich, and they made their first withdrawal using Sam's ATM card. Once he had returned to the Camden Martinique apartments, Dan had just enough time to shower, change his clothes, and send Julie yet another round of strange text messages from Sam's phone. I need to talk to you. Can you come here around midnight? Please, come alone, please. A little while later, when Dan arrived at the Hungry Artist Theater for the final showing of the play he was in called Nine, this was not the same theater where hours earlier he had killed Sam, his fellow actors would report that Dan showed no sign of any stage jitters. Instead, he gave what some of his colleagues described as the best performance of his life, playing opposite his beautiful bride-to-be, Rachel Buffett. After the performance, Dan stood for a moment backstage by himself and checked Sam's phone. Once he saw that Julie had agreed to meet Sam at midnight, Dan smiled. Then he stepped back into the group of friends who were all congratulating him on his great performance. Then he and Rachel headed home where Dan would shower yet again. He would have sex with Rachel and then he would tell her he was stepping outside just to go for a little walk. In reality, he was making his way over to Sam's apartment to wait for Julie. At midnight, Julie arrived, and then when they both went inside and Dan went into the back bedroom and called out for Julie, Dan did, in fact, have something he wanted Julie to look at in the bed, but not because there was anything for her to actually see. Once Julie had walked into the bedroom and put her bag down and stood in front of the bed, not seeing anything on it, Daniel reached around around her and pointed at the center of the bed and told her she needed to look closer to see what he was talking about. And so confused, Julie leaned forward looking at the center of the bed where there was nothing. And as she did that, Dan pulled out the same pistol he'd used to kill Sam earlier in the day and he aimed it at Julie and he fired two shots into Julie's head, hitting her just below the tiara that was now tangled in her blood-soaked hair. Moving quickly, Dan arranged the scene as he would any other stage set. Using scissors he had brought with him, Dan cut through the waistband of Julie's jeans, pulling them down around her hips to make it look like she had been sexually assaulted. Then he took a black magic marker and wrote, All yours, F you, on the back of her sweater. Satisfied that he had created the perfect frame job that would have police chasing down Sam Hur as Julie's murderer, and knowing police would never find Sam, Dan backed away from Julie's mangled and bleeding body and returned to his own apartment, where he showered yet again. The next day, Dan returned to the Liberty Theater where he had killed Sam. This time, he brought an axe and that same pair of scissors with him. 
Returning to the attic, Dan used the scissors to cut off Sam's clothes, and he used the axe to dismember Sam's body. Dan left Sam's naked and headless body upstairs in the theater, but using plastic bags he had picked up at a nearby cafe, Dan packed up Sam's head and hands and one arm and stuffed them into a backpack. Then, Dan left the theater, drove to the El Dorado Nature Center three miles away, and there he scattered Sam's remains in shallow openings he found or dug near the bases of trees and under bushes. Then, Dan, who was so far behind on his rent he would soon be evicted from the Camden Martinique apartments, and who desperately needed money to pay for his upcoming honeymoon, headed for the ATMs, where he would meet Wesley Freilich and collect another $400 installment of Sam Hur's combat. That pay. It is possible that Daniel might have gotten away with the brutal murders of Sam and Julie, but in those early morning hours of May 27th in the Costa Mesa police station, at about 2 a.m., when Dan was asked by detectives what specifically he had seen when he looked at Julie's body sprawled out on Sam's bed, Daniel Wozniak delivered exactly the wrong line. I saw two gunshots in her head. All three of the police officers who were listening to that interview knew that anyone who was just looking at Julie's body, like Dan claimed he was doing, they would only have been able to tell there was a single wound. It would not have looked like two distinct gunshot wounds. So the only way Daniel could have known that there were two gunshots in Julie's head was if he had fired those shots himself. So when he still kept denying any involvement, the police told Dan they knew he was lying and they put him into a jail cell. They reminded him he was under arrest for being an accessory to murder and the only way he'd be leaving is when he told them everything he really knew about Julie's murder. And then the following afternoon, at about 1.15 p.m., Dan would further implicate himself during a conversation he had from the jail with his fiancée, Rachel Buffett. By then, Rachel knew Dan had been arrested. She had also found out from Dan's brother, Tim, that Dan had given Tim a backpack filled with bloody clothes and a 38 caliber pistol, Sam's passport, phone, wallet, and two spent shell casings. Instead of destroying the bag as Dan had told him to, Tim had just thrown the backpack over the fence behind their parents' house. When Rachel told Dan on the phone in a call that was recorded by police that she was going to tell the detectives what she knew, including the existence of this backpack, Dan whispered into the receiver, then I'm doomed. 30 minutes after this phone call with Rachel, Daniel would signal to police that he was ready to confess to what he did. The cameras show him sitting at a small table in the interrogation room, elbows on the table, head resting in his hands. Yes, he had murdered Sam because he wanted that $62,000 in combat pay that Sam had saved from his deployment to Afghanistan. And yes, he had murdered Julie just as a decoy, a way to mislead police into thinking that Sam had disappeared because Sam was not a war hero, but rather a killer who had gone on the run after murdering Julie in a fit of rage or jealousy. When asked by police why he did it, Daniel told them, I'm crazy. It was always all about the money. Following Dan's confession, police searched the Liberty Theater and found Sam's badly decomposed partial remains. The only way to recognize the torso as belonging to Sam was the heart tattooed on his chest that was inscribed with the words mom and dad. On May 29th, the day Sam Hur would have turned 27 years old, police found his head, hands, and one of his arms scattered throughout El Dorado Nature Center. More than five years later, on December 16th, 2015, Daniel Wozniak was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. At the penalty hearing in September 2016, Daniel was sentenced to death. Three years later, a separate jury found Dan Wozniak's ex fiance Rachel Buffett to be an accessory after the fact, after further investigation revealed that she had lied to police to cover up her possible involvement in the crime and to protect her then fiance Daniel Wozniak. As for the families of the victims, June Kibuishi wonders if she had taught her children, especially Julie, to be too kind. And for Steve Herr, the thought of his son's final moments will haunt him for the rest of his life. Thank you for listening. 38-year-old Linda Jensen could not believe how lucky she was. As she and her husband Charlie looked down at the beautiful face of their brand new baby daughter, Linda could not stop smiling. And when Charlie leaned down and gave Linda's cheek a gentle kiss and told her how much he loved her, 
Linda felt like her heart might burst with happiness. For both Linda and Charlie, this moment and this new addition to their family was something neither of them could have imagined when they first met almost 27 years earlier. That's when Linda, age 8, had gone on a summer vacation with her family to Spicer, Minnesota, where they stayed in a lakefront cabin that had been owned by one of Charlie's relatives. Charlie, who had been 12 at the time, had spent most of his time at the lake playing with Linda's two brothers. But as summers went by, and Linda and Charlie both grew out of their awkward teenage years, the childhood friends had eventually become childhood sweethearts. And after Charlie came back home to Minnesota after serving in the U.S. Army as a combat soldier in Vietnam, everyone in both their families knew that Charlie and Linda would get married. Charlie in his dress military uniform, and Linda looking beautiful and radiant in her white bridal gown. Four years later, on January 27, 1974, the couple had their first child, a little boy named Andrew. But by the time Andrew was just four years old, his parents' marriage had fallen apart. Like a lot of other Vietnam veterans, Charlie had come back from the war with a psychological condition called post-traumatic stress disorder. Symptoms included feelings of irritability and edginess that had been triggered by his combat experience. And over the years, Charlie's drug of choice for treating his PTSD was alcohol. Lots and lots of alcohol. Finally, in 1978, after nearly seven years of marriage, Linda had filed for divorce. Not because she didn't love Charlie, but because his constant drinking had made their life together impossible. And after that divorce, Linda would spend the next 12 years of her life never quite able to forget Charlie, and also never quite able to find any relationship that didn't end in one kind of a disaster or another. There had been a long-term relationship that had produced another son, a little boy named Joey, but that relationship ended without Linda marrying Joey's father. Not long after that, there had been one more failed marriage, which had taken Linda and Joey first to Colorado and then to California. In both relationships, the breakups had left very bad feelings. Linda's ex-boyfriend and Joey's father had been a partner with anger and substance abuse issues, who refused to pay child support for Joey. Linda's ex-husband, who still lived out in California, had adopted Joey, but he'd never forgiven Linda for not having any children with him. And things had only gotten messier during the divorce proceedings when her ex-husband, John Silliman, was ordered to pay Linda $300 a month in child support for Joey. Finally, with no place left to go, Linda had accepted the offer from her older sister, Sandy, that Linda and Joey should just come back home to Minneapolis and live with Sandy until Linda could pick up the pieces of her broken life. Now, as Linda looked up at Charlie from her bed in the hospital maternity ward, she could not even see the smallest trace of the angry and damaged-seeming young man she had left behind 13 years earlier. Because, for Charlie, the divorce from Linda had been a wake-up call. And once he realized just how much his drinking had cost him in terms of his marriage, family, friendships, money, and work, Charlie had made a promise to himself and to his son, Andrew, that he would get clean and sober. And that's exactly what Charlie did. And by the time Linda had returned to Minnesota, settled herself and her eight-year-old Joey into her sister Sandy's cozy little wood-paneled bungalow and started looking for a job, bumping into Charlie again was like meeting up with the man of her dreams. No longer a drinker, Charlie was now a successful carpenter and contractor who had taught those carpentry skills to their son, Andrew. And like Linda, Charlie was unattached, and the same attraction and feeling of friendship that had drawn them together back when they were childhood sweethearts was still very much there. In fact, the hard life experience they both had gained in the years they'd spent apart seemed to make that attraction even stronger and deeper. And before long, Linda was slipping out of the house she shared with her sister a few evenings a week after Joey was in bed, and coming home later in the evening looking like she'd just won the lottery. Sandy and Linda had always been very close, and Sandy had been the one person Linda had confided in over the course of the last 12 stormy years. And Sandy knew her sister well enough to know that there was only one man who had ever made Linda look that happy, and that man was Charlie Jensen. So it came as no surprise to Sandy when Linda and Charlie had announced that they would be getting married again. And the date they chose for their wedding, April 3rd, 1991, was exactly 20 years to the day that they had gotten married the first time, 20 years earlier. What had been a surprise had been the fact that shortly after moving in with Charlie, Linda had gotten pregnant, 
And by the time the couple had said, I do, to one another for the second time in their lives, Linda was already seven months along. And now, two months later, on June 12, 1991, Charlie, who was 42 at the time, and Linda, who was four days shy of her 39th birthday, were once again brand new parents. And for Linda, the arrival of baby Lisa marked the beginning of the life she had spent the last 12 years looking for. By late February 1992, when baby Lisa was eight months old, Linda, Charlie, Joey, and Lisa had all settled into a comfortable routine. The roomy three-bedroom house that Charlie had just finished building two summers ago had a deep wooden porch out front that overlooked the yard and driveway and the trees that shaded the house from the sun. It was one of Linda's favorite places, and it also became a gathering spot for Andrew, who now had a son of his own, and for Linda's sister, Sandy, who visited as much as she could to see Linda and the kids. Linda had taken time off from her job working at a local school with disabled children. Charlie had plenty of construction jobs, but he still managed to spend as much time as he could with Linda and their grandson, as well as with Lisa, Joey, and Andrew. And by late summer, Linda had gotten back to her regular exercise routine. In addition to dropping in at the local health club, Linda had also started running again, and it wasn't long before she was a very familiar sight in the nearby neighborhoods that were part of her daily five-mile loop. And it wasn't just Linda, Charlie, and baby Lisa who were all thriving. Linda's son, Joey, who had been disabled by a severe stroke when he was just six weeks old, had also settled happily into his new life in Minnesota. He enjoyed being part of a close and loving family, and he enjoyed his role as big brother. And now that he was about to turn 10 years old, Joey was also looking forward to joining the local Boy Scout troop. It wasn't until the last weekend in February, on Saturday, February 22nd, that Linda had given her sister, Sandy, the most recent update on the one dark cloud that had drifted into the Jensen's otherwise very sunny life. The sisters were sitting on the sofa in the living room, catching up on family news. Linda had talked to the local Boy Scout troop leader about signing Joey up for Boy Scouts. Charlie was working on a construction site all the way out in Maplewood, 50 miles away, and that after a long Minnesota winter, March and spring were finally not too far away. But when the ring of the telephone interrupted their conversation, Sandy immediately noticed the look of strain that flashed across Linda's face. Sandy knew that sometime within the last two weeks, Linda had gotten two calls from Joey's biological father, Robert Beard. Despite having given up custody of Joey and not paying child support, Robert was now insisting on having longer and more frequent visitation with his nine-year-old son. Linda had left Robert after he had become physically abusive, so Robert's calls and escalating demands had felt very threatening as well as upsetting. But a moment later, Linda's face had relaxed, and she had insisted to Sandy that she, Linda, and Charlie had the situation under control. And by the time Sandy was ready to go, the conversation had veered into memories of the past, and Linda's announcement that Charlie had always been the only man Linda had ever loved. By the time Sandy was hugging Linda goodbye, Linda was joking that the only real problem in her life now were the painful shin splints she had gotten from all of her recent running. And two days later, on the morning of Monday, February 24th, that was absolutely true. When Linda woke up that morning and took her first few steps across the cold bedroom floor, she winced as the sudden pain flared up along her shin bones. But glancing at her watch, Linda actually welcomed how fast the pain had cleared her mind because once again, she had managed to oversleep. After pulling on her sweatsuit over her t-shirt and underwear and checking that baby Lisa was still asleep, Linda hurried into Joey's room to wake him up. Linda had meant to get out of bed when Charlie had kissed her goodbye and left for work at 6.45 a.m., but the last thing she remembered was hearing Charlie tell her that he'd changed baby Lisa's diaper and that he'd see Linda that evening after he got back from Maplewood. Peeking out the window now, Linda saw that it had snowed the night before, which meant that Andrew's outdoor carpentry job would be canceled and Linda would not be watching her grandson that day. Linda was glad that Charlie's job out in Maplewood was indoors, but she also couldn't help thinking how nice it would have been if today had been a snow day for them too. 
By 7.45 a.m., baby Lisa was awake and had her morning feeding, and Joey, his breakfast toast still clutched in his hand, was climbing onto the school bus and waving back to Linda and his eight-month-old sister. After watching the bus drive off down County Road 15, Linda turned back to the house and walked on sore legs to the front door. She had told Charlie before he left for work, and before she fell asleep instead of getting up, that her shins hurt too much to go running that day, so her plan for the day was just to hang out with the children and enjoy the view through the sliding glass door that led out onto the front deck. Now standing at baby Lisa's changing table, Linda unwrapped Lisa from her cocoon of blankets, but decided to leave the baby in her pajamas in the playpen while Linda cleaned up the breakfast dishes. But just as Linda was ready to go back out to the living room and get Lisa dressed for the day, Linda was surprised by the sound of a knock on the front door. The Jensen house was set far enough away from the road with a long enough driveway that the family did not get that many unexpected visitors. But this was Big Lake, Minnesota, population just over 3,000 people, and most people here never even bothered to lock their doors, let alone think twice about opening that door to a neighbor who might need help or a favor. So after leaving baby Lisa right where she was, in the playpen in the living room, Linda dried her hands on a kitchen towel, and with a smile, she walked to the front door. At least she'd have something interesting to talk to Charlie about when he called, as he always did, sometime during the morning from any job site where he was working. It was 9.30 a.m. when Charlie made his first call home to Linda. She usually picked up right away, eager to find out how he was doing and tell him about something wonderful that Lisa had just accomplished. Now, frowning a little, he drummed his fingers on the telephone receiver while he waited for Linda to pick up. Instead, the answering machine came on, and so Charlie left a message for his wife, telling her he'd try again later. But after the third unanswered call of the day, Charlie decided to leave work early. Linda sometimes screened telephone calls by letting them go to the answering machine, but if that was the case today, she would have picked up as soon as she heard his voice leaving a message. As he hopped into his truck and drove northwest from Maplewood towards Big Lake, Charlie told himself not to worry. Maybe Linda had decided to take a nap at the same time she had put Lisa down for a nap. Maybe she'd stepped outside onto the front deck to look at the snowfall. And besides, school had let out, so by now, Joey should be home with his mom and baby sister. By the time Charlie walked into his house, it was 4.05 p.m and the first thing he noticed was the sound of eight-month-old Lisa crying. Charlie immediately yelled out for Linda, but Linda didn't yell back. Dropping his coat onto the nearest chair, Charlie followed the sound of Lisa's crying through the dining room where he saw Joey doing his homework at a small table near the wall and into the living room where he saw baby Lisa in her playpen, still in her pajamas, her face red and wet with tears. Even as Charlie picked Lisa out of the playpen and stepped over to the foot of the stairs to call his wife's name again, he knew something was wrong. Linda would never have let Lisa stay in last night's pajamas for the entire day. And again, when Charlie did not get a response from Linda, he put Lisa back down inside of the playpen and automatically began a search of the house for his wife. Joey had seemed uncertain when Charlie asked whether Joey had seen his mom, so telling Joey not to worry, Charlie started his search in the laundry room in the basement where Linda would have been out of Joey's sight. But by the time Charlie left the empty basement to check the upstairs bedrooms, he wasn't even trying to act calm. Taking the stairs two at a time, the question went round and round in his mind. What on earth could have happened to his wife? But not even Charlie's worst nightmares could have prepared him for what was inside of the bedroom that he and Linda shared. When he pushed open the bedroom door, the first thing he saw was a bundled up white quilt on the floor at the foot of the bed. Only it wasn't just a quilt. Peeking out from the folds of the material, Charlie could see Linda's shiny dark curls and her long bare slender legs. And in the middle of the quilt at the center of a dark red stain, Charlie saw the wooden handle of one of the kitchen knives he and Linda kept in a butcher's block on their kitchen counter. Falling to his knees on the floor next to Linda's body, Charlie reached out and pushed a fold of the quilt down so he could see Linda's face. And that's when Charlie knew that the woman he had loved ever since they were both children was dead. 
A few minutes later, and the circular drive in front of the Jensen's two-story house had started filling with emergency medical vehicles and deputies from the Sherburne County Sheriff's Department. Charlie's 911 call had summarized everything the newly widowed husband would be able to tell police about his wife's murder. Quote, My wife is dead. I just got home and my little boy is here and I checked in the bedroom and she's been stabbed. I've got two kids here. My God, what's happened? As medics entered the house and confirmed that Linda was dead, deputies from the sheriff's department got busy putting yellow crime scene tape up around the perimeter of the Jensen's house. They also began spreading out into the rural neighborhood to see if anyone in the area might have seen or heard anything unusual that day. Knowing they had a homicide on their hands, the Sherburne Sheriff's Department immediately contacted the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, located 47 miles southeast in the city of St. Paul. Soon, along with state investigators, the Sherburne Sheriff's Department would also get help from law enforcement in Benton and Stearns counties, along with help from the nearby cities of St. Cloud and Elk River. But even before those outside agencies had arrived in Big Lake to help conduct interviews and process the crime scene, investigators with the Sheriff's Department had already come to some of their own conclusions about the murder. After doing an informal interview with Charlie, who had described his entire day and all his interactions with his wife, from the time he woke up and left for work, to the series of unanswered phone calls, right up until the moment he dialed 911, police were working on the assumption that Linda had probably been murdered sometime that morning. That guess would later be confirmed by the autopsy report on Linda's body, which would further narrow the time of the crime to sometime between 8 and 10 a.m. Based on the brutality of the crime and the fact that there was no sign of forced entry and nothing of value appeared to be missing, police also assumed that this crime was personal, not the result of a robbery gone wrong. And finally, given that Linda was naked when she was wrapped into the white quilt and then stabbed, police also believed that what they were looking at was not just a murder, but a violent sexual assault. And this assumption would also be confirmed when the medical examiner found traces of semen on Linda's ankle and inside of her body, along with defensive wounds that suggested that she had struggled with all her might against her attacker. The medical examiner would also discover that the actual cause of Linda's death was strangulation, and that she had likely been dead even before the killer had plunged the 10-inch long blade of the butcher's knife so deeply into her chest that the fabric of the quilt had become embedded in the wound. According to one investigator, it looked to the police like someone had actually tried to carve Linda's heart out of her chest. And Linda's sister, Sandy, would later remember the medical examiner telling her that along with the surface bruises, scratches, and deeper bruising to her sister's body, there was a single dried tear on Linda's cheek. But unfortunately for investigators, even though they had lots of details about how Linda had died, they did not have many clues about who might have committed the crime. It would also turn out that aside from the semen samples that the medical examiner would find in and on Linda's body, there just wasn't much physical and forensic evidence that crime scene techs were able to recover from inside of the Jensen house. Whoever had raped and killed Linda had stripped the sheets, which may have contained hair, blood, and skin tissues, and taken them away with them. According to Charlie, the only other items that appeared to be missing might also have contained DNA evidence the t-shirt and underwear that Linda had been wearing that morning and that she was probably still wearing when she was attacked. The first obvious suspect in Linda's murder was her husband, Charlie Jensen. It hadn't taken police long to learn that the couple had been married back in 1971, but had divorced because of Charlie's post-traumatic stress disorder, which made him prone to anger and irritability, coupled with his alcohol abuse. But over the next 72 hours, the police would confirm Charlie's work alibi. Charlie would also pass a lie detector test and volunteer a DNA sample that would eventually rule him out as Linda's killer. But even as Charlie was being cleared from the suspect list, 
police were already following what they believed was a very promising lead provided by the mail carrier who delivered mail along the rural route where Charlie and Linda lived. According to the mail carrier, when she had arrived at the Jensen house at 11.30 a.m. on Monday, February 24th, the day of the murder, she saw a white male in a copper-colored pickup truck pulling out of the Jensen's driveway. The mail carrier's description was detailed enough that police artists were able to put together a sketch that showed a man in his 30s or maybe 40s with scraggly brown hair and a gray flecked beard who had what looked to the mail carrier like red scratches on his hands. Less than an hour after the sketch was released to the media and featured in print and TV news, the tips from the public started to pour in. And soon police were interviewing anyone in Big Lake Township who had reported seeing the copper-colored 1970s Ford pickup truck or its alleged driver. On March 2nd, six days after Linda's murder and two days after her funeral service, a heartbroken Charlie Jensen packed up the home he had built for himself and Linda and moved his little family into an apartment building. As Charlie would tell his adult son Andrew and Linda's sister Sandy, it was just too hard for Charlie to walk into that bedroom where Linda had been killed. 11 days later and 17 days after Linda's death, police saw their only solid lead in the Linda Jensen homicide go up in smoke. The mail carrier who had helped police draw a sketch of a possible suspect she saw driving away from the Jensen's property on the morning of the murder began to change her story. She now thought that instead of being copper colored, the truck she saw might have been light green with white panels and snowplow brackets on the front. And instead of having a scraggly beard, the driver may have been wearing a coat with a fur-lined collar. Meanwhile, police investigating other men in Linda's life were also running into dead ends. After learning that Joey's biological father, Robert Beard, had been arguing with Linda in the two weeks before her death about visitation with Joey, they didn't waste any time bringing Robert in for questioning. Police also knew from conversations with Linda's family that Linda had said that Robert had been physically abusive and had a bad temper as well as substance abuse issues. And at first, Robert Beard looked like he could become the new number one murder suspect. In conversations with police, he was angry and defensive. He lied to investigators, denying that he had recently spoken with Linda on the phone. His alibi, that he was home alone at the time of the murder, was weak. But Robert also pointed out that since he did not have a car or driver's license, there was no way he could have gotten undetected to Linda's house and killed her. Once Robert lawyered up and refused to give police a DNA sample, the only thing police could do was keep him on the suspect list and move on to the next man in Linda's life, her ex-husband, John Silliman, who lived in California. Although John's alibi, that he was working at a local elementary school on the day of Linda's murder, turned out to be airtight, there was something about John that just made police suspicious. He'd clearly had a volatile relationship with Linda, and he told police that Linda had pressured him into adopting Joey instead of having children of their own. It wasn't until police went through John's financial records with a fine-tooth comb to rule out any murder-for-hire scheme that police crossed John off their list of suspects. By the end of May 1992, nine weeks after Linda had been found brutally raped and murdered in her own bedroom, the investigation into her death had ground to a halt. Police from three different jurisdictions had followed up on more than 1,000 tips they had interviewed hundreds of friends, co-workers, family members, neighbors, and possible suspects. They had searched but failed to find any trace of the sheets and clothing that had been taken from the Jensen house on the morning of Monday, February 24th. They had also collected and stored more than 80 DNA samples from men who had any connection to Linda, from a trainer at her gym who had once given her a bouquet of flowers to her ex-lover and husband's none of them would match the semen sample collected from Linda's body. But while investigators may have quietly and reluctantly shelved the murder book on Linda Jensen, there were three people in Linda's life who absolutely refused to let the case go completely cold. At least twice a week for the next seven years, Linda's older sister, Sandy, called the Sherburn County Sheriff's Department asking if there had been any developments in the case. Charlie also remained in touch with police, 
and he and Sandy made an appearance together on a popular TV show that featured true crime, hoping that the publicity might result in someone coming forward with new evidence. The third person who would not let the case go was one of its lead investigators. Bruce Anderson had made a promise to the Jensen family that he would not retire from the Sherburne County Sheriff's Department until law enforcement had found the person who had killed Linda Jensen. Like Sandy, Deputy Anderson was convinced that someone out in Big Lake Township held the key to solving this homicide, that someone had information that they might be holding back or that they didn't realize was important. Even after all the leads seemed to dry up, Sandy, Charlie, and Deputy Anderson had one strategy left. They all urged law enforcement and the media to ask again if anyone could remember anything that might turn out to be related to the murder. But it wasn't until the early summer of 2000, more than eight years after Linda Jensen's murder, that police finally got the tip they needed to break Linda's unsolved homicide case wide open. By then, Bruce Anderson had been elected sheriff of the Sherburne County Sheriff's Department, a position that gave him the authority to call for the creation of a special cold case task force of state and local law enforcement whose job would be to reopen the investigation into Linda's murder. The new round of publicity, along with a $20,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Linda's killer, was enough to get people, once again, talking and thinking about the unsolved homicide that had terrified the residents of Big Lake back in 1992. And on a mild day in June of 2000, the Sherburne County Sheriff's Department got a visit from a woman named Angela Hennen. The renewed interest in Linda Jensen's murder and Sandy's pleas through the newspapers for everyone to search their memory for anything that might shed light on her sister's murder had finally struck a chord. And after eight years, Angela was finally ready to give police the man that she had long suspected of hiding a very dark secret. What police found out when they followed up on Angela's tip would send shockwaves throughout the state of Minnesota. And based on that information, here is a reconstruction of what investigators believe really happened to Linda Jensen on the morning of Monday, February 24th, 1992. The knock on the front door of Charlie and Linda's house was so not expected that Linda almost dropped the plate she was holding into the open dishwasher. But even though she was surprised to have a visitor this early in the morning, it never occurred to Linda not to answer the door, especially since another loud knock might wake up eight-month-old baby Lisa, who had fallen asleep in the playpen in the living room. So after wiping her hands dry on a kitchen towel and zipping the top of her tracksuit all the way up to her chin, Linda pushed her hair back from her face and walked out to see who was coming to call. Even as she started to peer out one of the front windows, Linda recognized the voice calling to her from outside. A moment later, and Linda's visitor was stamping the snow off his boots before stepping through the open door. But even as Linda closed the door behind her visitor and apologized for how untidy her house was, Linda's killer was hardly listening. Instead, he was drinking in every detail of Linda's appearance. He had been watching Linda for such a long time, but until now, he had never really been alone with her, never really had a chance to let her know how he felt about her. He wanted to ask her if she was planning to go for a run that day, and he wanted to tell her how much he always looked forward to seeing her jog past the house where he lived with his wife and four kids. But before he could even find a way to put his proposal to Linda, he could see that she had stopped smiling and had even taken a few steps backward, and now she was asking him what he was doing there because now really wasn't a great time after all for her to have any company. And if this was about Joey, she'd rather talk some other time when Charlie was there too. But before Linda could get any further away from him, the killer reached out his hand and grabbed her arm. And as soon as he did that, he knew it didn't matter how Linda felt about him or what Linda wanted. What mattered was what he wanted. And after a short but violent struggle, the killer had Linda right where he wanted her. Upstairs in the master bedroom, all her clothes stripped off, her dark curly hair spread out on the bed under him, looking just as she looked in all of his fantasies, right down to having his hands wrapped around her slender throat, squeezing as hard as he could until finally she stopped struggling and lay still. Once Linda's killer was finished, he bundled her body inside of a clean white quilt and pushed her down onto the floor at the foot of the bed. 
Still breathing heavily, the killer straightened his own clothing, then left the bedroom and went down to the kitchen. On the counter, next to a jar of red and white candy canes, he saw the butcher's block with its collection of kitchen knives. Grabbing the wooden handle of the largest knife, Linda's killer hurried back upstairs to the bedroom. Looking down at Linda, lying on her back with the quilt wrapped around her, all he could see of her body was the top of her head, and her slim legs from the knees down, her heels resting lightly on the floorboards. Straddling Linda's midsection, the killer raised the knife and began stabbing at Linda's heart, over and over again, until finally plunging the knife through the center of her rib cage with so much force that it pinned the quilt into Linda's chest. After hauling himself back up onto his feet, the killer turned to the bed and stripped off the sheets and gathered up Linda's torn t-shirt and underwear. Rolling everything into a ball, the killer took one last look around and then left the bedroom, hurried down the steps, picked up his coat from where he had dropped it near the door, and just a few minutes later, Charlie and Linda's neighbor and the leader of the local Boy Scout troop, 28-year-old Kent Jones, was already halfway back to his own house less than half a mile away. In the weeks after Linda's murder, local police would interview Kent Jones after hearing a report that he had seen the copper-colored truck police were looking for driving around Big Lake Township. But during that routine interview, not only did Kent deny knowing Linda Jensen, Kent's wife gave her husband an alibi for the day of Linda's murder. It wasn't until eight years later that Angela Hennen, who had had an affair with Kent sometime after Linda's death, would tell police that whenever she had brought up the subject of Linda's death, a crime that everyone at the time was talking about, Kent reacted violently. When Angela had asked if Kent had ever met Linda, at first he insisted really aggressively that he had not. But later, Kent brought up the subject himself and told Angela that in fact, he had known Linda. Kent's violent reaction and the way he talked about Linda Jensen had always made Angela wonder, in the very back of her mind, if Kent might have somehow been involved in Linda's death. It would turn out that Angela's suspicions were 100% correct. Not only did Kent Jones know Linda from her inquiries to him about getting Joey signed up for Boy Scouts, he had become obsessed with the beautiful dark-haired woman he'd seen out running several times a week. And he had begun to watch her closely and learn her routines and fantasize about her constantly. When police re-interviewed Kent in June of 2000, Kent's wife contradicted Kent's claim that he had never met Linda. In front of investigators, Deborah Jones reminded Kent that Linda had actually come by their house to pick up a Boy Scout application for her nine-year-old son. Police also discovered that Kent had a criminal record. He had been convicted of insurance fraud, and in 1995, three years after Linda's murder, Kent had been convicted of domestic violence. That charge stemmed from an incident in which Kent's wife was hospitalized for four days after suffering a stab wound to her stomach and two puncture wounds on her forearm. Deborah would later tell police that the stab wound was the result of an accident, that she had slipped and fallen onto the knife, which was resting blade up in the family's open dishwasher. Although Kent refused to voluntarily give up a sample of his DNA, investigators quickly came back with a search warrant that forced him to provide a DNA sample. Less than one month later, the DNA analysis came back with a match. Kent Jones's DNA matched the DNA found in the semen that the medical examiner had collected from Linda's body. On July 25, 2000, eight years and five months after Linda Jensen's brutal murder, police arrested Kent Jones for first-degree murder and sexual assault. 17 months after his arrest, on December 8, 2001, and then again at a new trial five years later, Kent Jones was found guilty of those charges and sentenced to life in prison. In 2009, 17 years after Linda's murder, Angela Hennen would collect $18,000 in reward money for giving police the tip that led to the arrest and conviction of Kent Jones. For Charlie Jensen, Linda's death at the hands of Kent Jones has left some scars that will just never go away. Quote, he took a mother away from her children, a wife from her husband, and a beautiful person away from the world. End quote. Thank you for listening to The Mystery. Throw your 
know it gets me down when you're never around cruising dark streets alone you let the darkness surround me oh Girl, you know it gets me down when you're never around. Cruising back streets alone, you let the darkness surround me. Oh, oh, oh. oh, 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 oh. Dr. Ballin Podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please remove the rubber lip from the Amazon Music Follow Button's dustpan so they can never quite get everything up when they are sweeping. This podcast airs